How can we understand events if the news media that we rely on reduces controversies over public interest and justice to nothing more than spectacle? Today on Roundtable Perspective, Dr. Danielle Kilgo joins me in examining how media coverage of controversial events both in the United States and internationally are framed such that it biases public opinion. Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Lee Arts. I'm joined by my guest, Dr. Danielle Kilgo, today to discuss social unrest and media framing and how we come to know those events. Dr. Kilgo, I'm sorry, Dr. Kilgo is a PhD in journalism from the University of Texas and assistant professor at the University of Indiana. Welcome. Thank you. Um, you've written several essays um, that were published in journalism. Uh, studies and also mass communication in society addressing questions in Framing Ferguson, which was the shooting death of Michael Brown in 2014 and then the protests that followed. And also um, you did an essay on the coverage of the 43 Mexican students that disappeared on the bus one afternoon. Um, so uh, what prompted you to investigate these kinds of news coverage? Yeah, so when I started um, uh, my research in, at the University of Texas, I started sort of in the space of Trayvon Martin, and I was particularly interested in memes. I was interested mm -hmm. in the, the pictures that people would use to describe what was going on uh, with that particular situation. And there were some atrocious memes um, that used to represent, that were used to represent Trayvon to uh, minimize what happened to him mm -hmm. and um, that's where I started and while I was really knee deep in the literature to try to figure out how I, I produce a study as a doctoral student um, in a really rigorous program, Michael Brown was shot and killed and, and um, was laying in the streets mm -hmm. and my attention immediately turned to this space. Um, uh, during that time, there were all kinds of other things that were going on too. The ice bucket challenge was happening, um, and just a little bit later was when the Ayotzinapa uh, issue happened. But during the space between August and um, November, when uh, in 2014, in 2014, yes, when Darren Wilson was um, not indicted by the grand jury, that I was glued to TV, glued to social media, glued to um, also talking to my neighbors and people that I know and trying to understand how they came to some of the perspectives that they came to. And so it was really that situation that thrust me into looking at how the media framed this okay. coverage because I was interested in what created um, these truly polarizing issues um, and uh, public opinion climates. Well, pu public opinion is partly, um, partly um, the result of news media and the agenda setting of the news media over multiple years, even multiple generations. But in this case, the one particular instance, you could look at a real-time coverage of an event that was um, devastating to some and kind of a ho-hum to others. So when you're doing this, how did you, um, well, what newspapers did you choose? Why did you choose those? How did you look at the content to determine the frames that were going to be presented to the public? Right. So initially, we looked at legacy papers. Um, we started with the New York Times, um, USA Today, some of the larger circulated okay. papers. Which the ones that Americans are going to read and is going to set the, the news agenda. Absolutely. Okay. And the ones that we um, thought would adhere more to the more um, elusive, objective uh, nature of our ethical standards. The that myth we of journalism. Yes, yes. absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we started there, and also we picked up the St. Louis Dispatch so that we would have an opportunity where Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson is near St. Louis. So yes. Right, it's okay. the largest local newspaper that was that was in the area yeah. um, to see how journalists that were closer to this area in Missouri, how they covered the issue. Um, so we selected them using that methodology. And, and what were the frames that you thought you might find and what were the frames that were developed? So we started with a set of frames that was um, used in previous literature, usually in war, that is used to categorize the frames that um, help us understand war protests. 
um, and protests generally that challenge the status quo is sort of a broad idea okay. about where these frames come from. And most of them are based on actions. So um, one is the riot frame, the focus on violence, um, on property destruction, on protesters um, sort of interjecting with our society. Um, and then the confrontation frame, that protesters are at battle with uh, the government and police forces, they get arrested a lot, things like that. Um, the next frame is more like a spectacle frame, that, that they uh, adhere to the sensationalism of the protest. They look at for odd and unusual behavior, mm -hmm. very sensationalistic journalism approaches. And then the final frame we really look for that is consistent in journalism practice is uh, what we call the debate or the protest frame. And it's more of a legitimizing frame. It says that there's some substance to this protest. It says that they have um, legitimate uh, demands, that there's an agenda, that there's some type of organization that means we should try to at least take that um, that, or that protest or that social movement seriously. Um, in conjunction with that, we looked also to see if the narratives that were coming from advocacy organizations, if those began to show up in, in the spaces too. So um, were, were the issues framed as race? Were they framed as a police issue? Were they framed as a militarization issue? How did the demands that were um, bubbling up from these advocacy organizations, how did they appear in that coverage? Seems like there's two parts to this. The first is you just outlined four different frames that journalists might use. Um, it's interesting that none of those uh, cross over into the realm of fake news, which seems to be a popular term nowadays, because any of those frames could be filled in with actual events or actual activities or objective facts, but you put them in one frame, you're going to get one understanding of the event, which isn't fake news. You put them in another frame, and you're going to get a different understanding of the same event, particularly if you're not there, right? If, all, if your only source is reading the paper or watching TV, if the frame is one of confrontation, that's how you're going to understand the events. If the frame is one of just spectacle, kind of circus-like, that's how you're going to understand it, and it would seem like be more dismissive. Yeah, no? Yes? Right. Well, if there's, a, if there's a proliferation of that particular kind of frame, that's generally how people will see it. So if there's a ton of, riot, of the riot frame or this violence frame, then generally people will walk away thinking, this was just a violent protest. Right, These right. people are unruly, right? Um, and Which allows the uh, reason for the protest and the events that precede the protest to be dismissed Absolutely. and removed because it's like they're just irrational unruly, uncivil people, that's kind of the way protesters are, and protest becomes uh, a category. Protester, what it is and the substance is dissipated. But, Absolutely, yeah. right. And, the, and the, the problem with um, the violence frame or the riot frame is that um, oftentimes it's accentuated beyond when the violence actually occurs. And so if you see, uh, for example, in Ferguson, there's, there wasn't a ton of rioting. There wasn't right. a ton of violence. Yes, the, it, it did exist, and journalists should cover it when it does. But um, talking about it continually over and, over and over and over and reinvoking the idea that they, these are violent protesters or were at some point or might be in the future, that um, reinvoking that idea is problematic. And that's where not necessarily this becomes fake news, this becomes more of a uh, bias or even just some sort of disinformation, right? right. Um, that, that there's not. What well, strikes a, me as soon as you adopt one of those frames, what comes out of that is going to be biased. Because if you're adopting the frame of this is a riot or a protest, or if this is just a spectacle, you've already established how you're going to define and how you're going to evaluate whatever happens within that frame, and there's no way else to do it. So it's biased from the beginning with the frame. It certainly can be. And I think that you know, if there is violence in a protest and they lead with the riot frame, that it makes sense if there, if there was some sort of civil unrest where a building was burned. Well, I, but I, I would disagree with you. I mean, Martin Luther King said riot is the protest of the people. So if you're going to say riot is the protest and you're going to label it that way, you've collapsed it. But if you say riot is an indication that there is a substantial social problem here that needs to be addressed. Otherwise, normally, civil people would not come to this. I, I'm suggesting that there's a bias that informs journalism, even in the journalism schools, when they're trying to raise this idea of objectivity. Um, 
And I think the bias is to cover the action, right? It yeah. is to cover the action and to not think about it in that, um, in its broader context. The right is the language of right. the unheard. And not, not being able to yes. position that violence as, you know, 60% of Ferguson, uh, the residents there had warrants out for their arrest at that time. Yeah. I mean, the riot part of what had happened and the frustration with what had happened in Ferguson is part of exactly that sort of depth. It's part of the unheard. This is what happens. But um, should journalists not cover that, I, I think, becomes the question, and that they should. If there's violence, they should report the violence. They should also give the depth that well, we the, see in the debate the, frame. Yes, the interesting thing is, I mean, what I guess I have an, also an issue with what the journalists should do and what the media should do. I don't accept the myth that the media is there to represent public interest. They're an industry. They're making a profit. People will read the paper more when there's spectacle or where there's violence. And I was reading the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times at the time, and I was also reading those papers when Charlottesville happened. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is Ferguson, where there wasn't much, they broke some windows, right? It was framed as a protest and a riot. But Charlottesville, where they actually were armed and a woman was killed, the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune framed it as a parade. They called it a parade. And a One's rally. called it, right, right, a parade and a rally, which from the beginning, that's not fake, but it's by using those terms, which could be de objectively defended, it tells the people that aren't there what's happening. Well, here's just a bunch of people that are out for a parade. Here's these counter protesters suddenly that show up, and then we have this problem, which is a whole. And in both cases, I'm sure the journalists at either of those papers or the ones you studied would say, well, we're just reporting what happened. But when you start reporting what happened from a frame, it's going to go one way or the other. Absolutely. And what happened when we talk about uh, the framing of the U.S. papers of the events in uh, Mexico where the, where the 43 students kind of disappeared? It's been in the news recently as well. How does that compare to the coverage of uh, Michael Brown or other police shootings? Right, so what we looked at the U.S. Um, domestic coverage and looked more broadly than we did before. So this wasn't just newspapers, this was also broadcast papers, some of the digitally native papers, alternative newspapers. And for the most part, what we found was that the, the U.S. domestic coverage of a uh, domestic protest was uh, much more focused on these negative representations yeah. than we, than than the coverage of Ayotzinapa and the protests there. And the problem with that is that the events were so similar. There's mm -hmm. a government intervention in the death. There's um, many people who are looking for questions. There's many people who are pointing to the government to make some kind of intervention. There is scandal involved. There's a, a lot of similarities there, which is why we compared them in the first place. But um, the coverage is strikingly different. And I think that, that that study that we did and the differences that we find there is one point where we can, we can show journalists when they're there is violence in a protest and when there is peacefulness afterwards, yeah. this is how you would report it differently. This is how you would report it in a way that doesn't necessarily degrade that protest or stereotype that protest because we know um, protests that um, are related to black issues are often framed in a way that they're violent in the so first the, place. So the framing in Mexico um, by the U.S. press was different than the framing of protests in the U.S. by the U.S. press. Yes. So the framing in Mexico treated it as, was the government more culpable? Was the, the social problems that the students were traveling to Mexico City to protest, were they, those more prominent in the coverage? They were more likely to explore that issue, right? And there's um, all kinds of reasons why that might be, but it existed there and they yeah. talked about the fact that the government might be involved. They talked about the demands that the, um, the protesters had. They talked about the grieving families and how they just wanted their kids back. Um, they gave these people their victimhood, which is not the same thing that we saw with the Ferguson protests. And um, the, the um, framing of the authorities comparing Ferguson to Mexico. The authorities were framed how in the U.S. by the U.S. press? Uh, for the most part, the authorities are non-existent in Ferguson, right? Oh, really? So they don't th speak of the police or the governor? Or it's less of an issue, right? Uh -huh. They, the elites, um, drive the narrative for Ferguson. They were able to control the conversation. They um, talked about why the the guard was going to be brought in and why they're going to brought brought out. Um, All in response to the protests, the the danger, the pro absolutely. Property. They, so that becomes the focus, not the role of the government in. 
whatever leads to it or not even the role of the police? No, the, the police militarization and the idea that there is an issue of police brutality was not the most prominent theme that was coming out of Ferguson coverage. It was that this is a race issue. This is a race issue, and then maybe sometimes this is also a police issue, but mostly it's just a race issue. And so the race so issue is, doesn't necessarily, uh, the race issue is like it's the problem of those people. It, they, have a, they have a race issue, as if there isn't one that exists. There is Am a, I overstating that? <laughs> I think that the, um, what we saw in the coverage was that, that this was about a black community and a white police force, or a predominantly yeah. white police force, that this was the issue. Not the death, not the um, potential for him to have used excessive force, not that particular narrative, not until after yeah. um, Darren Wilson was So indicted. how did the government get framed by the U.S. press, the government or the police forces or the authorities in Mexico. Well, they were questioned, and that's okay. what's most important, right? They, they, um, there wasn't a um, sort of a vitriol narrative yeah, that, that we would associate yeah. with Mexico right now that goes in our political rhetoric, but it was sort of a question: What is, what is happening? Did this happen? They, we think that they're associated. That this is worth the time to go and think about. This is worth our time to go and. Um, uh, consider the, what the government's role was in this issue. One of the things you mentioned early on when you talked about framing, um, and I think it, uh, in looking at your essays, one of the things that popped out to me was the the uh, function of sources. So if I'm if I've chosen one of these frames, it almost directs me to certain sources. Um, so what are the sources that were prominent in U.S. coverage of? If we're using Michael Brown and the, and the police shooting of Brown, which I would extrapolate to many of these same kinds of coverage, because once you accept the frame. So who are the sources that get to be, you said that the, you looked at advocacy groups, so they're, to what they're extent were their voices allowed versus other voices that were considered more what, objective or authoritative? Their voices are stifled in both local and um, in, uh, national coverage. The, the social movement or the people that are protesting for some justice, their voices are stifled. Yes. Um, and the legitimate, and sometimes they're, even when they are allowed to speak, they're not um, giving enough time or enough depth or even um, a person that was part of the organization um, that can provide more factual information, oh. right? So sometimes they're not even sourcing um, someone who is truly involved. Um, uh, they source bystanders quite a bit, so people the who are just voice. on the outside <laughs> looking in and what happened and how that felt. The victims of, of riots, right? The people who own the stores yeah. downtown, they, they were sourced more often than protesters were. So we saw that a lot. Um, but so, the, you're, so there's, a, there's a police shootings, <laughs> young black men are killed. The people that live in the community that face that threat of police shootings are not considered valid news sources, but the people that don't live in, a, in, the, in the context of being threatened with shot or police force or police violence are the ones that are raised to the level of authorities sources for covering this event. They're not covered near as much as the officials are, right? Yeah. But they definitely have a voice in the narrative and they help characterize it. One of the things that happened in Ferguson was that there was a, they had to close down the schools for a few days. And that, the narratives around those few days, that children are scared to go to school and the principals oh. can't let their children come, just that whole uh, narrative of fear, that protests are something to fear, that, that, that taking action or believing this cause is something to fear. Um, is all driven by the bystanders and the people, the community outside of, of the protesters themselves. It seems that one of the things that framing may do then is not just choosing a frame to help you decide what sources you're going to use or what the frame is going to be, but there's also, a, it, it almost moves you in the direction of being able to evaluate these events. Well, right? I think so one if, of the you're, if, if you're saying this is a, a riot or a protest, and your sources are authorities or the innocent shopkeepers or the kids, what's my evaluation going to be as a reader that's not there? How am I going to interpret that or evaluate that? 
Right, so what we found about audience interpretation is really important and it's not a direct transfer just because there is a proliferation of one doesn't mean that you're gonna believe yeah. that way. Um, and that's really different based on um, people's assessment and their uh, ability to identify with the protesters. Yeah, if I live in Baltimore and I've seen police brutality, I'm gonna be less likely to believe whatever the New York Times or the USA Today is saying about Ferguson because it's, uh, I'm not gonna be as susceptible to it, but those people that don't have that experience. Right, you'll be informed, by, yes. right? You'll be informed by your own experiences. The media is not the catch-all. It doesn't, right. it doesn't um, you know, drive our minds and how we think, um, but it does influence it in, in, a, in a way that is cal can be calculated. One of the um, interesting things in one of the essays, I don't remember what it was, where you're looking at, I, I think you called it digital native news, or that's different than social media. It has a different narrative, it has a different frame. How is that, what does that tell us about events and how they're framed and how we can cull information? Yeah, the digitally native news organizations are- Which are? <laughs> which are like um, BuzzFeed or BuzzFeed News, right? Or, okay. or MIC or Vi uh, Vice is sort of traditional but um, is increasingly becoming more digitally native. Now this is one that we might consider digitally native. Um, but these uh, new kinds of organizations are saying we don't necessarily have to conform to the rules. We can take a side if we want to. Um, we just don't, we are not bound by the same journalistic rules that we, you would expect the New York Times yeah. to follow. Um, and they're also not critiqued in the same way, right? So they have a little bit of privilege there of coming in as the new guy on campus. And their narratives are different. Their narratives a lot of times align more with what we think about alternative media. Um, and what is great about that is they have outreach. They have, and they do um, have some sort of legitimacy with their audiences. Um, even if it's not the New York Times, they still have power as a media entity. They're still more organized than- Power for, power in what sense? In terms of the media, the media power, just to be able to distribute a, a narrative um, to a mass audience that they have collected. Okay. Um, so they have that type of power and they also have a narrative that is often more susceptible to giving us debate, that, that gives us um, the Do they, demands. Are their sources or their voices wider than what we find in the traditional commercial media? A lot of times they are because sometimes they're even hurting for writers so they let people come in as, you know, the Huffington Post does this a lot. They let people just start their own blogs that they did before and you could um, uh, you are able to be sourced as a as a as a writer for you can contribute to these online na uh, native organizations and a lot of times that was an opportunity for them to give people voice a lot of times it created um, space for people to have their their narratives told by themselves or mm -hmm. by someone else who was a more proliferate writer is there a relation then between b because when you're talking about the, the blogs or these other sources or other forms of social media, which oftentimes may just report or pass on the AP or the New York Times, but in the case of BuzzFeed and Mike and some of the others, there's actually, a, it seems like you're saying there's a wider public access, even though there's individual writers. You're more apt to be able to get your story told on BuzzFeed or Mike than you are get your story told in the Chicago Tribune, unless yeah. you're a journalist. I think that we saw that there was there were more opportunities, right? They did provide more opportunities than we saw in the New York Times, for sure. So you're um, th when you when you started the project, you're, you, I, I read that you're counseling and, and suggesting what journalism should do. I wonder if you bump up against that um, that effort with the structures of the industry. So here's what the New York Times should do, and here's what St. Louis Post-Dispatch should do, but they're not going to because it's not gonna make them profits. The journalists may want to, but they're not gonna be able to maintain their job. But on the other hand, you have these other forms of journalism that is much more open and sounds like much, at least provides different frames, so we're not just subjected to one. So it seems there's a relation between media access and public information and the structure of the industry. But, but the, the new structure of the industry has given us diversity of thought, which is, which is a bonus. But my work in terms of informing journalism, I think does apply to both sides here because um, ultimately, 
one of the biggest problems is sourcing, is who they source. And I don't believe that the frame is, is selected intentionally by the journalist and then they go find the sources that fit that frame. I don't think that's how framing works. I think it sort of is a um, deductive process. But uh, the sources also are, are incredibly problematic. And what they say and how they say it um, is is what is really driving that narrative, rather than just journalists wanting to um, fulfill the status yeah. quo. I, I, I always think it's a problem when we start talking about the intent of a particular journalist. Right. But what you found was the intent wasn't as important as what the consequence. And I, I would, I'm happy that you're doing this. I hope you keep doing it. I would like to see more of these um, um, coverage, because it strikes me that this may not be intentional, but it is consequential, and it's repetitive. So we may not be able to identify the intent, but we can certainly find that this kind of framing, the four frames that you mentioned before, continues, 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 continues. It may be through the J schools, it may through, be through the structure, it may th be through the journalist bias, but it's, uh, it's there and it affects the public. And this is uh, wonderful work and I, I, I hope that more people um, get to look at it. We could talk for another half hour, but <laughs> our time is up and I wanna thank uh, Dr. Danielle Kelgo today on uh, Roundtable Perspective. I'm Lee Arts, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>